Hello class, so for today, our topic would be an introduction to Philippine historiography, sources, and discourses. So at the end of the discussion, this you will be able to, one, define history, second, differentiate history from historiography, third, restate the sources of history, analyze how historians write history, recall some Filipino historians and their contributions to historiography. Now, we have already established the introductory part of history, but we will be reiterating the topic here in this particular lesson. So, history deals with the study of past events. Individuals who write about history are called historians. So, they seek to understand the present by examining what went before. So, they undertake arduous historical research to come up with a meaningful and organized reconstruction of the past. But whose past are we talking about? So, that is an important question that we need to answer here. So, this is a basic question that a historian needs to answer because this sets the purpose and framework of a historical account. Hence, an important feature of historical writing is the facility to give meaning and impart value to a particular group of people about their past. The practice of historical writing is called historiography. Traditional method in doing historical research focuses on gathering of documents from different libraries and art archives to form a pool of evidence needed in making descriptive or analytical narrative. However, modern historical writing does not only include examination of documents, but also the use of research methods from the related areas study, such as archaeology and geography. Now, let's do the sources of history. Basic to historical research is the utilization of sources. These are diverse sources of history, including the documentary sources or documents, archaeological records, and oral and video accounts. To date, most of the historical sources are documents. These refer to handwritten, printed, drawn, designed, and other composed materials. These include books, newspapers, magazines, journals, maps, architectural perspectives, paint, advertisements, and photographs. Colonial records such as government reports and legal documents form a significant part of our collection of documents here and abroad, particularly in Spain and the United States. In the 20th century and up to now, memoirs, personal accounts with, written by important historical personages constitute another type of documents. Philippine presidents such as Emil Naldo, Manuel Quezon, and Isdado Macapagal their memoirs to highlight their roles as nation builders. On the other hand, archaeological records refer to preserved remains of human beings, their activities, and the environment where they lived. In the Philippines, the most significant excavated human remains include the Kaliao Ma Mansto bone, dated 67,000 BCE, and the Tabon's Man skull cup, dated 20,000 BCE. Aside from human remains, other archaeological records are generally categorized as fossils and artifacts. Now, when we say fossils class, these are remains of ants, plants, and other organisms from the distant past, while artifacts are remnants of materials culture developed by human beings. So, this includes cl clothing, farm implements, jewelry, pottery, and stone tools. Oral and video account form a third kind of historical source. These are audiovisual documents of people, events, and places. These are usually recorded in video and audio cassettes and compact discs. From scholars, media people also use oral and video accounts as part of their news and public affairs works. So, trivia, the first published work in the Philippines is entitled La Doctrina Cristiana. Now, let us 
discuss the primary and secondary sources of history. So, these are the two general kinds of historical sources, primary and secondary. Now, when we say primary sources, this refers to documents, physical objects, and oral or video accounts made by an individual or a group present at the time and place being described. These materials provide facts from people who actually witnessed the event. While secondary sources, on the other hand, are materials made by people long after the events being described had taken place. Most historical narratives today are so reliant on documentary sources due to plethora of written records and the lack of archaeological records and or, or video memoirs. Although having documents about an event allows for easier counter-checking of facts, history researchers are confronted with basic challenge with regard to primary sources, so their ability to read and understand text in foreign languages. Many of our untapped archival documents here and abroad are written in Spanish. A good knowledge of Spanish is a huge advantage. This, this is what I claim in the first video that most people who wrote our history are not Filipinos, but they are Spaniard. There are Americans, Australians, and even Japanese. But this skills is unusual among today's historians who refers who prefer to read translations of Spanish texts such as the fifth volume, the Philippine Islands from 43 to 1898 edited by Emma Bear and James Robertson, which is the most cited collection of resources about the Philippines before the advent of the American colonial regime. The collection includes translations of portions of 16th century chronicles, such as Antonio Pegafetas, Premo Viaggio Interno al Mundo, Luarca's Relacion de las Islas Filipinas, and Juan de Placencia's Relacion de las Islas Filipinas. Filipino historians such as father-daughter tandem of Gregor Gregorio Zaide and Sonia Zaide have also compiled and translated colonial documents. They published the 10-volume Documentary Sources of Philippine History. Aside from reading the Spanish originals, documents, or translated words, another daunting task for Filipino historian is to discern the cultural context and historical value of primary sources because most of these primary documents were written by foreigners and reflected Western cultural frames. For example, derogatory term used to label Filipinos such as pagan, uncivilized, wild, and savage abound in these colonial documents, uncovering myths and misconceptions about Filipino cultural identity propagated by the Spanish American colonizers is extra challenging for contemporary Filipino scholars. This is the main reason there are a lot of misconceptions and myths the world have known among Filipinos because of these writers and authors who are foreigners who attempted and who really did write Filipino history. So this is now the challenge of the Filipino historians in the contemporary world on how they are going to change and correct the wrong perceptions written by those foreigners who first wrote our Filipino history. If the key function of primary source documents is to give facts, secondary source documents, on the other hand, provide valuable interpretations of historical events. The work of eminent historians such as Teodoro Agoncillo and Renato Constantino are good examples of eminent historians or secondary sources. In his interpretation of the Philippine Revolution, Agoncillo divided the revolution into two phases. The first phase covers the years from the start of the revolution in August 1896 to the flight of Emilio Aguinaldo and Camp Hong Kong as a result of the Pact of Biak na Bato. While the second phase spans from Aguinaldo's return to Manila from Hong Kong until his surrender to the Americans in March 1901. 
However, Constantine refuted Agoncillo's leader-centric scheme of dividing the revolution into two phases by stressing that Agoncillo's viewpoint implied that the revolution came to a halt when Aguinaldo left the country. Con disputed the soundness of Agoncillo's two-phase scheme by asserting that the war of independence continued even without Aguinaldo's presence in the country. As you can see in the narration that I have made mention earlier, there is also conflict views made by historians. So this is also another challenge in writing Philippine history. Among Philippine historians, they are also, um, they are also disputing and debating as to what is the viewpoint that we really need to integrate in the treatment of our history in the country. So aside from the issue on the Philippine Revolution, there are other contending issues in the Philippine history, such as the venue of the first Christian mass in the country and the question of who deserves to be named national hero. By and large, interpretations serve as tools of discernment for readers of historical sources, but they should be cautious of frames of analysis used for discriminatory and self-serving ends. Now, let's proceed to the historical criticism. Many documents have primary and secondary segments. For instance, examining a newspaper as a source entails a discerning mind to identify its primary and secondary components. A news item written by witness of an event is considered as a primary while a feature article is usually considered as a secondary material. Similarly, a book published a long time ago does not necessarily render it as a primary source. It requires a meticulous reading of the document to know its origin. To ascertain the authenticity and readability of primary sources to be used in crafting a narrative, a historian needs to employ two levels of historical criticisms, namely external criticism and internal criticism. Now guys, let us try to examine what is external criticism. It answers concerns and questions pertinent to authenticity of a historical source by identifying that compose the historical material, locating when and where the historical material was produced, and establishing the material's evidential value. Now, when we say internal criticism, on the other hand, this deals with the credibility and reliability of the content of a given historical source. This kind of criticism focuses on understanding the substance and message that the historical material to convey by examining how the author framed the intent and meaning of a composed material. So, let's proceed to locating resources. How are we locate primary sources? So, sources about things here and abroad in the country government institutions the national library and the national archives are major repositories of documentary sources so here we could find mostly the primary sources in the national library and the national archives in manila particularly now the colonial historiography or those colonialist the Spaniards, the Americans, and even Japanese who were writing our history. So Philippine historiography has changed significantly since the 20th century. For a long time, Spanish colonizers presented our history in two parts, a period of darkness or backwardness before they arrived and a consequent period of advancement or enlightenment when they came. Spanish chroniclers wrote a lot about the Philippines, but their historical accounts emphasized the primacy of colonial, colonialization or colonization to liberate Filipinos from their backward or barbaric life ways. In the same manner, American colonial writers also shared the same worldview of the predecessors by rationalizing their colonization as a way to teach the natives of a civilized lifestyle which they said the Spaniards forgot to impart, including personal hygiene and public administration. So colonial narratives have portrayed Filipinos as people bereft with advanced culture and respectable history. This perception challenged Filipino intellectuals beginning in the 1800s to rectify such cultural bias or prejudice. In 1890, 
Jose Rizal came out with an annotation of Antonio de Morga's Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, or Events in the Philippine Islands, a book originally published in 1609, and he used de Morga's book, a rare Spanish publication that positively viewed pre-colonial Filipino culture, as a retort to the arrogant Spaniards. However, cultural bias against Filipino culture continued even after Rizal's death and the end of Spanish colonialism. So learning from the fate of its colonial predecessor, the United States did not only use brute force, but also affected ingenious ways of pacification, such as the use of education to control their subjects and increase political and economic of the elite few. These colonial ends were so ingrained among Filipinos that they have perce perceived their colonial past in two ways, initially maltreated by wicked Spain, but later rescued by benevolent America. So this kind of historical consciousness has effectively erased the memories of Filipino generations. The Blood American War was exemplified by the Balangiga Matter in Eastern Samar and the Battle of Budbagsak in Sulu. Consequently, such perception breathes new life to the two-part view of history, a period of darkness before the advent of the United States and the era of enlightenment during the American colonial administration. This view has resonated with Filipino scholars, even Americans granted our independence in 1946 after the World War II. So next meeting, we will be continuing our lessons, our lesson two, pertaining to the history of the Philippine Islands. So I hope that you will be taking notes while you are listening to the podcast or audio. And do not forget also and highlight by taking, by, by taking down those important people. So you could save this video and repeat it all over if you cannot hear this properly but do not forget also to subscribe and click the notification bell so that you will be notified from time to time if i will be uploading here new materials for our class thank you very much